Hey folks, thanks for joining me for this episode from the Embellished Pod. If you got here by chance, please take a moment to hit the subscribe button. Hopefully I can be found on any podcasting platform that exists. And if you can't find me on a platform, send me an email at embellishpod at gmail.com and I'll get that taken care of. You can also find video versions of this podcast on YouTube. You can find all of my links on Instagram at embellishpod or TikTok with the same handle. I have a website. It is www.embellishpod.com. It's also a place to pick up these links, episode details, and more. Uh, today I have Miles Monroe joining me from Westward Whiskey. I've been a big fan of them for a number of years um and you know I've, I've, I've been aching to talk to them about american single malt specifically uh, so i hope you guys enjoy this this conversation so this this question is sort of related to um whiskey but maybe not really and it is more calendar rel- relevant than anything else um it it's girl scout cookie season are you a girl scout cookie fan oh yes it is i've already yeah i've already got some boxes <laughs> Which one is the best cookie? Oh man, that uh, that for me that's an easy one. Uh, was when I was a kid. Still is the the peanut butter and chocolate. The tag along, okay, yeah. The tag along, yeah, that's the one. Now the the second question, which is kind of a pivot off of that, is that also the best one to pair with whiskey? Wow. You know, I've actually, <laughs> no joke, done a good amount of uh, personal research into cookies and sweet things paired with whiskey in general. Got a got a pretty major sweet tooth. Um, and also, yeah, I, I feel like just, you know, I spent some time in the the restaurant industry as well, which actually led me to beer and whiskey. So I'm, I'm all about flavor pairings. That's a big driver of how I blend. But um, yeah, I can say for sure that's that's the winner. Definitely. Okay. And would it change if we were to say, you know, American whiskey versus uh, English whiskey, Irish whiskey, Scottish whiskey, Japanese whiskey, or is that just generically, it's going to always be that? Oof. I, th- I think that might not be universal. Yeah. Okay. I can say it's, it's great. You brought this up because I, I can't say I was having some, some thin mints last night and uh, not, not great with whiskey. <laughs> I, I will second that because I've done some very similar research in my life and um, thin mints belong maybe with coffee and, and, and you can sort of stop there um, or just by themselves. That's fine, too. And they're cold and you, you can put them in the freezer and they're really good from the freezer and they're also vegan. And so they have all these wonderful things, but it just doesn't belong with whiskey. Um, Absolutely. I agree with yeah, you. They have that redeeming quality. Think, yeah, they do. Uh, I think the most generic uh, pairing with cookie is tagalongs. The not tagalong, sorry, tree foils. The ones that are like the shortbread cookies. They go with just like oh, any yeah. spirit in the world because they're oh, super yeah. generic. But I could see those playing uh, nicely with with lots of things. Yeah, yeah. What are those uh, Samoans with the coconut? Yeah, the Samoas. It, it, coconut is such a divisive flavor. I think right. It like is. Just, some people but, are like all in on it, and some people are like, I could care less. You know. Yeah, it's um, the Samoas. I, I think could pair nicely with West with whiskey. Um, you know, especially if it's like I think an American whiskey that's got that kind of coconut aspect from the New Oak. Um, don't quote me on that. I haven't tried it, but probably should. It it does go with whiskey for sure. I, I just haven't done the, the the pairing research on the Samoas because that's also my wife's favorite, and so uh, I don't get to eat many of those. You know, we, we've got this is my box. This is your box. This is the family's boxes. Um, and, and the Samoas <laughs> usually stay in that in that realm, and it's probably best for all of our um, A1C levels that we we kind of keep that together. Um, another question, completely unrelated to uh, cookies, um, and I, I've I've watched some interviews and I've read some interviews on your behalf, and um, you, you mentioned enjoying uh, to spend time alone, reading, listening to music, whatever. Um, and in this role that you're currently in, you end up having to talk to a lot of people a lot of the time. So the, the question for me is, are you an extroverted introvert or an introverted extrovert? Well, um, that's a great question that I don't know if I have the answer to because, uh, look, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I'm somebody that I've played in bands. I've, I've sung on stage, you know, I try to stop me doing karaoke all night. I come from a big family, so I'm, I'm just used to being around a lot of people and, you know, making your voice heard if uh, you can rise above the above the noise. Right. But uh, I think like with anybody, you know, there's there's just time you need to kind of recharge and have to yourself. It's been a funny transition for sure to have 
you know, gone from a brewer and a distiller where, you know, that attracts a certain kind of personality type. You're kind of way in the back, just doing your own thing. It's a pretty solitary job, right? Whether you're mm -hmm. extroverted or introverted, I think you just get used to that. Um, but now at this point, I, I'd say sharing, you know, splitting duties between master blender and global ambassador for, for Westward. There's a lot of there's a lot of FaceTime out there that also comes with a lot of travel. And mm -hmm. so I think that's where the, the quiet times come in handy. You know, you're 19 hours off, you know, in Australia and going for two weeks and you just mm -hmm. you want to find some quiet time in the hotel room to maybe do nothing, you know, turn, <laughs> turn it off for a little while. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I have an answer for that. But um, no, that's that's perfect. And, and it, some people don't spend their time maybe thinking about that. You just know what what works for you. And um, th there's a lot of things that you like to do uh, in your private time. Uh, and one of those things um, you mentioned in other interviews about, you know, books and records, vinyl records specifically, and um, kind of punk being in your uh, in your repertoire. What is the favorite punk record that you have in your collection right now? Wow. Like my, my favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> and it can be seasonal, right? Because sometimes those things have been flowing, like you really get into this album for a period of time and, um, you know, whatever. Like, what, what is the thing right now? Absolutely. Well, um, you know, I guess I'd have to say right now, man, that's tough. Um, I was able to... Uh, there's this actually speaking of Australia, there's a record store in Melbourne called Vicious Sloth. And they're they're these mm -hmm. older guys that were around for that kind of first wave of punk in the 70s and early 80s. And they they've just they they were tuned into the scene then and they've got great records. And I was able to find a copy, a, an old copy of Seven Seconds, the crew. Mm -hmm. And that's that's been a longtime favorite of mine. And it's yeah, it's one that I find I keep kind of throwing on these days. Partly, I think, was because they they were able to, uh, gosh, was that last year? There was a tour of, uh, it was uh, Seven Seconds, it was Circle Jerks, and um, ah, who was that other one? Um, John Brandon, the Detroit hardcore band. Why can't I think of them right now? Um, but yeah, it, they all toured together and I got to see all three of those bands plays bands that I've, I've worshipped since I was a kid. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Seven Seconds, the crew is is on heavy rotation right now. Awesome. Um, and, oh, negative and, approach. And, there we go. <laughs> there you go. Negative approach. Gotcha. So I'm, I'm taking notes here because uh, as, as I drink the whiskey that people often create, I try to find what their influence is and if it's musical or if it's artistic or whatever, like... It, it doesn't always correlate, but you understand the person maybe a little better, right? Because there's some art and blending and there's some art and distillation and there's some art and um, in, in fermentation, right? There's there's science there specifically, but there's also this like mystical edge that's that's a little more artistic, at least in my in my perspective. Right. So you kind of get inside their brain a little bit more and understand uh, where they're coming from. But uh, you've also mentioned um, the Jesus and Mary chain uh, and some some previous interviews as well. Yeah. If I wanted to start out with, off with them, if I, if I, you know, this is where I'm. What album do I start with, or or do you have an album that you think you should start with, or you just start from the beginning chronologically? As far as just yeah, kind of a, a dive into their world, mm -hmm. right? Man, yeah, honestly, you know, they're 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 definitely my favorite band of all time. And uh, gosh, I mean, hard to say where to start, but um, I'd say Psycho Candy is probably the the place to start. Um, not their, you know, not their, uh, kind of breakout album, but it's definitely got a lot of the bangers on it. Um, I think that's like mm -hmm. a, a mid eighties one for them. And so this is maybe one of the, the last sort of weird questions that I'll, that I'll ask. Maybe not the last one, but one Keep of the weird last questions coming. I love it. Okay, perfect. Um, so, uh, do you have a, a guilty pleasure? Listen, right? Uh, you know, something that maybe a genre or something that you're like, you know, uh, I don't necessarily want to admit this readily, but I, I like to listen to this. And this is one of those things that I discovered as a, as a child. I grew up riding around in you know beat up old trucks uh, here in Kentucky, listening to country yeah. music through like a small speaker off of an AM band, so Fantastic. it didn't have a whole lot of like umph to it. 
And as I got older, you know, sound systems get better and, you know, you get something that has a little bit of bass to it and you start listening to those same songs and then you're like, I don't, why did I ever like this? Um, and I caught myself listening to it in the beat up old truck that I have. I'm like, okay, now I get it again. Right. Like the, I enjoy this because of the way it was delivered or whatever, but those things can become guilty pleasures, uh, and, and not things that I regularly listen to, but sometimes you're just like, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a dopamine dump or it's a nostalgia hit or whatever, um, do you have a guilty pleasures listen? Um, absolutely. Yeah, it's in excess. Yeah. You know, yeah, that uh, cranking out some of that like new wave pop in the 80s. And I just, I mean, when I was a kid, my dad was involved in rock and roll. And, and um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I got to, as a very, very young child, see in excess on that kick tour. And yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's not something that's got a lot of depth to it, um, but absolutely adore them and will, yeah, unabashedly blast it for sure. Man, I love that anecdote too about um, country music and the old truck. I, I have something very similar. I mean, I, I grew up in Rhode Island, uh, mm -hmm. but a rural part of Rhode Island. We actually moved there from Indianapolis. So I went from kind of the city kid that could walk home from school and was, you know, skateboarding in the park with friends to uh, dirt roads and cows and no no sidewalks. Right. So mm -hmm. it was a big change, but, uh, I remember, yeah, I have this great memory of, uh, riding with my, my best friend's dad he and I were, I was going to help, I think like bail hay or something. And I, I was pretty young and we're in his old beat up pickup, just cruising these country roads on like a nice sunny day. And he had Hank Williams on. And I, I, I don't remember ever hearing Hank Williams and just that exact moment, like it, it just hit and, mm -hmm. uh, man, I, I was hooked it becomes a core memory. Like it's, it's a thing that's locked in that you, you, you can almost, you know, smell the air again and the, the yeah. exhaust from the likely beat up truck and the, the sounds that come along with it. It's, it's definitely that. And um, I think that's the case with most r rural places. It doesn't really matter what the state is. The, the atmosphere is the same. It's just the accents different. That's the biggest part is like it, <laughs> how they say the things, uh, the tone of it is the only part that makes it slightly different. Um, yeah, absolutely. A super hard pivot. Um, you, you've 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 mentioned before as well. Like this is other people's research, but I'm I'm trying to take it a different way. Um, like one of your fa favorite places is St. Louis Cemetery Number One in New Orleans, mm -hmm. um, and you had mentioned there were um, a number of famous interments uh, and burials, however you want to phrase it. Um, they're there. Uh, I, I took the time to kind of look at it because I was like, I'm interested. I've I've been to New Orleans a handful of times. I love the city. There's something about it that feels alive unlike most cities you know there's yeah. there's a there's a vibe in cities but it has a more soulful feel to it so who when you say famous people that are buried there who are you referring to oh man yeah you know it's um new orleans i i, I lived there for a little while pre-katrina mm -hmm. and it, i think you nailed it there it's a place i mean that place is just it's got a feel it's tangible you know that 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 city has so much history and so much culture and that it, 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 it gets to know you and you get to know it. It's such a special place. Um, yeah, it's just real cool. Oh man. As, <laughs> as far as famous people go, I'm not sure. Yeah. I guess in, in my opinion, right? Like, you know, who's, who's, <laughs> who's famous there. Um, you know, I, I think it's just, you know, for the most part, just just in general that it is famous that, you know, you've got the, the voodoo queen um, mm -hmm. burial burial site there, which to me is, is pretty amazing. Um, and I, I, I think that ah, I do this. Actually, it's funny. We were talking about traveling and, and downtime and, you know, getting, getting some quiet time. But one of my favorite things to do, actually, while I travel and to get that quiet time is to is to visit cemeteries um one mm -hmm. to kind of find some folks i'm looking for um you know just in general if i'm in some weird corner of the world but also that's my quiet time right if you you one don't encounter too many living people in a cemetery uh and if you do everybody kind of wants to be left alone right you're just kind of wandering around mm -hmm. so, um to me it's it's uh it's really cool to uh just go there. I, you know, I, I used to take a lot of pictures. I was a photographer, so I, I still bring a 35 millimeter with me when I travel to uh, take some some pictures of things here and there to kind of, I guess, document my travels. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, to you know, to pop in and to me, it's it's Marie Laveau, you know, the voodoo queen. Mm -hmm. I think what's that pirate? Um, Lafon, I think, is it Lafon, the pirate that's buried there as well? Yeah, yeah he was, uh, he supposedly became one of Jean Lafitte's uh, pirates, right? They, yeah. So he's there. And that, because that, that's what's kind of wondering, because when I went and looked at it, we, we're, we're in a similar situation. So I, I grew up in rural Kentucky, but right next door to my childhood home is a cemetery. And so they've always been kind of, you know, near me. And uh, my wife is equally enamored with cemeteries. And so we've been to New Orleans cemeteries and we've been to ones in Savannah, Georgia, which have a very, very similar vibe and feel, oh, you know, the Spanish moss and, um, you know, Savannah feels like a, New Orleans, um, just a little more sanitized, maybe. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. And not necessarily in a good way. That doesn't, that, that, not like clean sanitized, just a little more sterile. Sterile, that's the word I was looking for, a little more sterile. I got um, you. Yeah, absolutely. But as I but dove in, I, I see, you know, okay, so Marie Laveau is there. And that's, you know, I, I kind of wondered if that's what it was. But then there's also um, the Homer Plessy from Plessy v. Ferguson is, is there, right? And so there's like a, that's there's right. a civil rights tie in. And then, uh, more recently, Nick Cage has bought the pyramid-shaped tomb for his future resting place <laughs> there as well. <laughs> so, so I was like, which one of these three? I have a suspicion which way it's going to go, but um, you know, it, it, which, which which one is it? Right? It's uh, Nick Cage is a different vibe altogether. You know, maybe we end up talking about Con Air or something like that. Um, <laughs> you know, you want to talk about divisive? I know coconuts divisive, but I'll tell you what, I think Nick Cage is even more divisive. <laughs> well, it depends on what era Nick Cage, right? If you're talking like early Fair era enough. Nick Cage, maybe not so much. If you're talking, you know, more recent Nick Cage, maybe, you know, the 10 year ago, Nick Cage was probably more divisive, but then the, the one with the vampire show, what's the, um, the one that he's been doing recently. Uh, See, yeah, I, I wouldn't know. Cause I'm, I'm on the, I'm on the no thanks side. <laughs> 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 that's it's, it's probably the right side if you, if you look at it from a historical perspective but um and i'm trying to think of what the name is. anyways it's sort of like yeah like with, with renfield, vampire right? movies yes yeah renfield that that there you go that yeah. thing that thing yeah. um there, there's a new generation of people who are learning about him for a different yeah. reason altogether than uh, <laughs> what we've what we've maybe known in the past right um you know, and, and I guess we sort of touched on it. You know, you, you, you like film, you like movies a lot. Um, what's, what's your favorite movie? Maybe. Oof. Favorites, man. This is, uh, I, I don't know if I'm ever like making these lists in my mind, you know, mm -hmm. of favorites, but, uh, I mean, I, I'd, I'd say if, if something right now, it, w it would have to be the hit. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've seen that movie. One of Stephen Freer's earliest. Um, John Hurt, Tim Roth, Terrence Stamp. It's um, it's a great movie. If you're if you're into any kind of like noir in any way. Okay, no, I, I think I have not seen this movie, but I'm I'm gonna put it on my list of things to watch. Some fantastic like to... actors in it. Yeah, you know, it kind of basically mm -hmm. it starts with uh, this British gangster kind of just drops the dime in court and 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 tells all and and sends everybody to you know to do their time and so then he's sent into hiding mm -hmm. and then it's like something like 10 or 15 years later somebody finds out where he is and they send these guys after him and it's it's a terrific movie it's not some over the top gory you know splatter fest which i love those too but uh it's right. really just it's um it's really cerebral it's um it's actually got this really cool like spiritual element to it Beautifully shot. A lot of it's outside, just these big, wide open kind of John Ford style shots. And um, yeah, yeah, that's a mm -hmm. that's a fantastic one. Yeah. And you're not wrong. You know, trying to identify the number one is always tough. And um, given enough time, I usually kind of take the the, the high fidelity uh, method of it of you know, what's top five. You know, the top, top five, five is yeah. easier to do than <laughs> than the, the top single. Right. Uh, but I always For found sure. when I do a top five, the first three come immediately. And then the last two, it's like, I've got all of these things that are jockeying for the last two slots. Yeah, and so who's going to make the same conundrum? <laughs> absolutely. And, and that list will change. It will absolutely change over time. Right. Yeah. It's constantly changing, evolving. Sure. That's the, Which at least is, that's the hope. Yeah. It, it should change over time. Right. If it doesn't, yeah. you're not continuing new things likely. Um, the, I mean, played in any 
No, so well, oh, sorry. Yeah. You know, even just I was um, I'm reading uh, Appreciating Whiskey right now, I think for like the third or fourth time and just talking about, you know, um, yeah, just how our, our tastes change too, right? It evolves and, you know, how, you know, we're, we're super sensitive and have way more taste buds when we're younger. And, um, you know, there's a certain element of bitterness that we just don't really appreciate until we're older. And to me, I, I, I absolutely agree with that, that I think appreciation for bitterness just mm -hmm. comes with maturity, you know, both in age and yeah. experience. Yeah. Uh, and, and the yeah. only time I think maybe that changes is if you grew up in a culture where bitter foods are a part of your day-to-day -day life you know um just there's some environmental influence but I, yes it, and it's probably because our taste buds are slowly dying off and so bitter isn't as harsh at 40 as it is at four right and right so maybe that's <laughs> right. where it lands and that, that that's great um so you played in bands um did, were you a guitarist did I, did I remember this correctly yeah yeah i played so, guitar and so, sang What's what's the guitar, right? So most guitarists, they have a model, they have the one that they, you know, this is it, this is the one for me. Yeah, yeah, um, I've, I've still got it, even though I haven't played in a really long time. I've narrowed it down to, I think I just have three guitars now, but the one, the go-to is, uh, <clears throat> is, is an early 80s uh, Fender Telecaster that uh, I've modified. I put a, a Gretsch pickup uh in that guitar just for more more feedback more mm -hmm. fuzz um yeah that's um even if i never play another note i'll i'll have that guitar and pff, until i die it's just yeah that's the tone the, those are the things that when I, i've never heard someone who was a guitarist or appreciated music that uh, sold a guitar that were happy that they sold the guitar five, seven, <laughs> ten years later. Everyone's like, man, I wish I had that back. And I mean, if it's a first act or, you know, some, you know, cheap Yamaha that you bought at a pawn shop and then you sold it a pawn shop again later on to make ends meet, those aren't the same ones maybe, but there's still some emotional attachment that it comes with um, instruments. You know, I, I don't have the ability to play, but I have a high appreciation for it. My wife on the other hand does. Um, she can play most instruments. And so I get to live yeah. vicariously through the love of instruments with her because, you know, for me, it's a wall hanger for her. It's something she can actually make noise with. And so that's really cool. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it's a great, it's a great way to, to, to spend a few thousand dollars is, you know, guitars or motorcycles or whiskey or yeah. uh, vinyl records or, or whatever. They're all, you know, got to have them all. Um, I guess Absolutely. we will, we will take a shift. Let's let's talk about whiskey now. We're 22 minutes in and haven't mentioned a ton of things about whiskey, which is the reason why you're here. Wow. Um, before we get too deep into it, and and this is just for my personal reference, and I've I've been a big fan of American single malts for a while. You know, pretty much since I started doing this podcast, and we're on year three. Um, I've been eagerly awaiting um, TTB approval of the regulations for it. Right. You know, it was two years ago I sat here and I was like, no. they're about to approve it and it's going to happen. And, you know, I'm so excited because I want to see where this can go for the United States. And then, um, we're two years after that and it's still technically not official, but <laughs> so tasting whiskey is a big thing. You, you, you said you're reading a book called appreciating whiskey right now. Um, and there's tons of people with, this is what you should do to cleanse your palate between tasting corn whiskey, right? Or, you know, whether it be bourbon or just corn based whiskey or whatever, or even rye for that matter. As I'm considering when I want to taste through American single malts, um, specifically ones from um, the U S what is, what would be, what is your methodology for a palate cleansing between it? You know, is it, is it corn chips? Is it water? Is it sparkling water? Like what's, what's the thing? What should we be using? Specific to American single malt. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, what we do here at in the blending room when we're, you know, just kind of tasting through a bunch of things and we're, we're narrowing samples down for a, a particular blend is, uh, yeah, lots of water. Uh, we'll use like the, um, like oyster crackers. Okay. Um, which I, I think is good to kind of cleanse your palate a bit. Um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd say if you're, you know, if you're tasting multiple brands that, um, for me, the trick is, is plenty of water and honestly, mm -hmm. just taking your time. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the kind of crook of the arm trick, mm -hmm. um, you know, the and crook that, of the I arm, or if you've not been using cool. strong hand sanitizer, you can smell right here on your wrist or, right. um, and, and those things work great for my nose. 
Um, and and I, I specifically asked about American sandwich because a lot of people that do corn whiskey are like eat corn chips, right? Because it stays in the mm. same vein. It does some of the same things that maybe oyster crackers might do, but it yeah. helps take away the corn flavor. And so you start tasting the other nuanced flavors that exist. And I didn't sure know. Enough. I like oyster crackers. I've used those in the past. This is this is perfect. Well, I, you know, and it's, it's, I think, tougher to nail down for American single malt because there's just, there's a lot less, I'll say, homogeneity to the brand, mm -hmm. right? It's, I, I would even say that we're, we're kind of taking uh, consciously or, you know, or not more of a winemaker's approach to making, making a whiskey, right? Saying, well, this is, mm -hmm. this is how I make it. And this, this, this particular whiskey, you know, speaks of its origins, right? That, mm -hmm. you know, you get a, you get a sense of where it's from. Um, and so I, I think that was something that was hard for people to kind of grasp for a while with American single malt was like, well, Hey, look, I mean, it's made all over the country. Some people are using a bit of peated malt. Some aren't, um, some mm -hmm. people are using new oak, some are used, um, different, different varieties of fermentation styles, you know? So I think it was hard for people to kind of wrap their heads around it and say like, well, what, what should I be looking for? And I think now that we're, we're far enough into the, the category that it's becoming somewhat mainstream. I mean, we've got Jack Daniels and Jim Beam and uh, I think Bullet just released one as well, well they, a couple of weeks ago. Um, they released one in name for sure. Uh, I'm not indeed. sure if you had a chance to taste it yet or not. I, I have. And, uh, you know, so that I think now people are kind of seeing like, hey, it's actually a little bit more about who's making it, where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. um, not, not that that wasn't the case with bourbon, but I, I think it's even more so uh, with with American single malt. And, and that's that's intentional. Right. That's that's part of, mm -hmm. you know, we helped form the uh, American single malt whiskey commission. Right. We were there at the beginning with with the other eight founders. And, you know, one one thing we all wanted to be really careful not to do was restrict creativity right mm -hmm. we we saw we saw it with craft beer right people people wanted choice they wanted a variety of flavors they wanted to explore they wanted to kind of go along with the maker um and you know dive into new flavors and new techniques and and new ideas and so that was that was really important to us was let's let's try as much as we can to not restrict creativity, which then of course means this category is a lot harder to nail down, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it's it's a bit of a double-edged sword in that way, in that, um, you know, if you pick up one particular, you know, let's say you pick up uh, a Balcone single malt, right? And then uh, you like it, and uh, or there's particular aspects of it that you like, and then you, you start cruising around for other ones and you come across you know, Virginia distilling or Westward or, or Copper Works in Seattle, you know, they're just, uh, they're, it's not going to be the same. And that's all right. Yeah. You know, that's, that's exactly how we want it. I don't think we'll ever have those kind of like regions that you find in Scotland, right? Like Highlands, Lowlands, mm -hmm. you know, Campbelltown, um, that sort of thing, which is, is at this point a bit more of a kind of marketing thing than, uh, than uh, I think it used to be, which again, that's all mm -hmm. right. I think it's established and it is what it is. But um, yeah, we're we're just a bunch of creative folks trying to just just push boundaries. And unfortunately, with that endeavor, sometimes you alienate folks, right? It's just that's just part of it. Mm -hmm. It's not our intention. Yeah, and you know, I, I think you know we're we're still talking about a, a you know a luxury item at this point, right? Uh, whiskey is a luxury item, and so um, just by existing, you're going to alienate some folks. You know, price is going to alienate others. Uh, geographical sure. identity will alienate even more. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I I think this is what makes it interesting to you know some of some of my my fellow whiskey nerds and myself. Um, is the the variation from brand to brand or even within the brand, right? Because um, you can look at folks that are doing American single malt and they have both a peated and non-peated offering, right? And so you can see the same thing that they're making or um, you've got some some folks that are doing mesquite and, and that's interesting. You know, they're, they're putting their own spins on it and that's, what's, that's what makes it interesting. And I think that's what um, will probably end up being the reason why it grows significantly as bourbon starts to trail off because – a lot of your your craft bourbon distillers they had to chase down a traditional flavor profile because everybody understood you know the base tenets of 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 tasting bourbon you know that sure I, I've done tastings of bourbon for people in the past and I'm like hey no matter where you go tell them you tasted vanilla you tasted caramel you tasted oak 
Doesn't matter what the bourbon is, where you got it from. Just tell them those three things, right? Um, and, and having that standard flavor profile is great, but it's also limiting because as soon as you step outside of that, then you get people uh, that look at it weird. And you know, I think about some of the stuff that the Leopold brothers are doing, you know, yeah. with their three chamber rye, you know, and that threw a whole bunch of people for a loop because it didn't taste like the ninety five five rye or the Kentucky rye or. We it, it, there's a group of us nerds that are here for the artistry of it, um, and and you guys have participated in identifying how American single malt should be defined um, at a federal level. Um, is there anything you, as an individual creator, say? You know, I wish it had this additional thing, or I wish it had a, a, a removal of this particular idea. And I say that from a perspective, I had one distiller tell me, you know, they wish they had just left it with. 100% malted grain specifically and allow for malted rye or malted corn to play in the same realm because we're not Scotland. And then I've also heard other people say, God, no, that would be terrible. Let's don't do that thing. Um, is there something in there that you wish was or was not a part of the definition? Absolutely. And, you know, it was something that was brought up when we were putting the, uh, the standards together that, um, yeah, I, I think that saying, oh, containers should just be wood containers. Mm -hmm. Definitely. When we're referring to, you know, casts or, or you know, wooden vessels that are going to hold the spirit for aging, for maturation, uh, for blending um, while you're, you know, while you're maturing. Yeah, I, th I think obviously oak is, is one of the hallmark flavors of whiskey, but it doesn't mm -hmm. mean it has to be right. We're also we're seeing, um, you know, people start to branch out and do fishes and a few things. I mean, I've, I've got a bunch of Ambirana barrels here, that Brazilian mm -hmm. teak wood, you know, um, was that barrel craft has been, has been putting out the, a great I, bourbon with that. Every, everybody's doing one now and it varies in its success. And I think barrel has yeah. done one of the best ones in the market because of its, yeah. its reserved utilization. Cause it can, if you're not careful, it can beat you up as a flavor. It, it's an assertive wood and, and it's uh yeah, I mean, you've got to be careful with it and, and pull it maybe a little sooner than you think for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it just in general, I, I think, um, you know, as we're trying to, yeah, not stifle creativity, I think by by limiting it to to just oak, I think in that way it does, does kind of slow things down a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Again, you know, oak is such a, a, almost, I would say, essential part of, you know, the character of whiskey in general. Mm -hmm. um, but um and, th and that's a hard one to, to argue. Like, I'm with you and I would love to see that, but I could also see everybody else. That in the world, oak is the thing, right? Like just in the world, yeah. if you think about, you know, Japanese whiskey, if you think about scotch, if you think about Indian whiskey, Irish whiskey, they're all talking about oak largely. And so you, you get too far out of it, but um, that's exactly it. It's, it's definitely innovation is, is what everybody's after. And so then you have to decide, okay, well, if I finish in this, is it still the American single malt but finished over here, which is the weird game that bourbon's playing now where it's like, it was a bourbon, but then if it gets put in a second cask, is it still a bourbon? I don't really know, but we're going to call it a finished bourbon or whatever. Um, on, on your labels, you also have Oregon straight malt, uh, as, as a second thing, or at least it's on the, the one that I have sitting right here. Um, is that a is that a state specific definition, or are you trying to differentiate from American single malt and saying we do fit in this, but also you know kind of the all bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon kind of idea? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so so we use yeah that term Oregon straight malt. That's something. I mean, if you find our our older original bottlings of Westward going back to you know 2010, 2011, and up until maybe 2014. Um, that's, that's the term we used Oregon straight malt. Mm -hmm. Um, we hadn't all banded together, uh, to, to have a term that defined it as we do now with American single malt. Um, we, that, that was the term we used. That's, that's what we, as a, as a company decided that that's how we were going to kind of put it out there at first. Um, you know, the, I think back then they were really, I mean, we got started in 2004, right? We're turning 20 this year. And, you know, we started experimenting immediately with with the kind of single malt that, you know, I think there were different versions, right? We experimented with different yeast strains, different um, cast types, as in ages of wood, you know, char levels, toast, that kind of thing, until we dialed it in. And 
you know, release the version of Westward that everybody knows now, but there were, there were iterations before that. And, uh, you know, I think there were maybe two or three other distilleries in the country making single malt at that time, mm-hmm. um, you know, back 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, Stranahan's kicked off in 2004. I think you had maybe Triple Eight, McCarthy's, you know, Clear mm-hmm. Creek. Um, wasn't a whole lot. And uh, yeah, that's for us, we just, we're, we were searching for a term and, and that's what we liked. And so I, I think for us, that still kind of resurfaces, you know, here mm-hmm. and there. Um, just like, you know, I, I think we're, we're not trying to confuse anybody. We, we are all of those things, as you said, of, you know, bourbon is a whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon, right? And so we consider ourselves an Oregon straight malt. We consider ourselves American single malt. We also, mm-hmm. we consider ourselves American whiskey, right? We're, yeah. we're making whiskey here in the States. So we are an American whiskey. Yeah, um, you, fit, you fit all three of those things uh, pretty well. Sure. Um, you know, and, and I will say the, the, the bottle redesign that went from the old style, which there was nothing wrong with, to the new style is possibly one of my favorite reimaginings of a bottle in the North American marketplace, period. Uh, there's just something about the new shape of it that, that it makes it stand out on a shelf in a great way, uh, where you know some bottles stand out on the shelf in not such a great way, but it's it's a beautiful bottle. Um, but in the in the process of saying that you, know, you guys have been around for 20 years and and you do have a Solera process running now, have you been running that Solera process the entire time or has it only been for a portion of those 20 years? Yeah, no, the, the Solera has been, uh, I guess, in the grand scheme of things, a somewhat new addition. I, I started developing it uh, probably five years ago. Um, not really sure uh, what what exactly you know it was destined for mm-hmm. um that's the that's the kind of dangerous thing about having a, a vision that's somewhat unharnessed right is was you know ultimately we want to make a whiskey that's you know full of flavor and balanced and approachable and and you know can like, as i said earlier speak of its origins but um there's a lot of times that b- because we're so collaborative and and really always looking to to try something new that you know we'll fit in our vision we're not going to dump mm-hmm. cocoa puffs in a barrel of whiskey just because we think it'd be fun. But, um, you know, it's, it's more like, uh, there, there are limited possibilities in other ways though. And so, you know, develop a Solera. Why? I, I'm not exactly sure, but I, I love mm-hmm. this technique. And I think that's something great and, and really fascinating about the craft distilling industry is, you know, we're borrowing from other, um, other makers, ideas and traditions, right? Like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan of cognac, Armagnac, I would say actually more than whiskey. Um, mm-hmm just barely but uh you know i I borrow a lot of maturation techniques from the old cognac makers that i I think are just really beneficial to single malt Mm -hmm. um solera as well that uh so no that's that's been a a somewhat new addition yeah probably about five years ago and and that's from that kind of sprang the idea of of milestone which is um you know something we released last year the first edition of that's sort of our i guess halo product um, something that uh, we we feel is is the next chapter in our story as as a distillery as a brand. You know, we talk a lot at Westward about you know front loading so much in our process of making the whiskey, right? Of selecting our Pacific Northwest barley, you know, um, having it kiln to our specifications by the maltster to our long fermentation times with our ale yeast. We talk a lot about those upfront processes and and how much of that character we really want to have um, in the final product, right? Uh, Milestone focuses a bit more on, yeah, barrel house techniques, maturation techniques, what we've learned from our experiments, you know, both good and bad, right? Uh, <laughs> And um, w- the way we're moving forward with it. So, so yeah, Solera is um, a somewhat new thing, and it's not practical, right? It, mm-hmm. it from a from a warehouse standpoint, and from a blending standpoint, it's really just not a practical way to 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 blend. Um, mm-hmm. But in in small amounts, like what we're doing with Milestone, it it's it's a wonderful way to do it. Yeah, and the the Milestone release um, is. It, it feels like you know you you do you, you you do talk a lot about the front end process that you do and the intentionality that's there, um, the exploration that you guys have done. Um, you guys have talked about that ad nauseum with a lot of folks, which is which is great. Um, and it feels like milestone is an opportunity to do the other end of that process where you've you've done all this intentionality, 
Um, and it's not that before the aging portion was an afterthought, but it wasn't necessarily the focus. The focus was on the grain. The focus was on the, the, the fermentation, the distillation, the, you know, kind of keeping it, um, exactly what you want it to be. And now you have this kind of robust thing that goes into play and it's, it's evidenced in a lot of things, or at least for me, right? You know, as, as I look at this milestone bottle, um, I see some details that are in it that are not necessarily on everything else, right? So, um, there's this, there's this, this phrase, verum factum, that's on the bottle itself that's not on previous release bottles, right? Um, and it's a new thing that pops up. And so, you know, what is the purpose of that? And, and I, you know, I read that and I'm like, okay, so who is, who's the philosophy person, right? Who's the person who's like, all right, I have this philosophical phrase that I want to put on our bottles that fits the intentionality, right? The intentionality of what you guys are doing. Yeah. Um, so is, is this you? Are you the one that came up with the Varum Factor or is it, you know, somebody else? No, that's me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that this is, uh, this is of course a, a group effort with, as with anything mm -hmm. with, with Westward that we release, but, um, I was kind of, uh, running wild on my own with this one. And yeah, I was reading this old perfuming book. I, a lot of our blending techniques when we're actually sitting at the table are based on, on perfuming, um, everything down to like the actual, you know, perfumers, like blending triangle where you've got your base notes and your mid and your kind of top notes that spice it. Um, yeah. And so, so I mean, I, I, I borrow a lot from that as well. Um, but the Virum Factum, that, that was, uh, that was something that I was thinking about while reading this, this perfuming book a few years ago. Um, and I think, yeah, it was that old philosopher Vico Virum Factum, which is like the, uh, the maker's knowledge, right? Pretty mm -hmm. much saying, um, this is, uh, this is true I, or I make it true by, by seeing it and following through and making it and, mm -hmm. and therefore making, making it true, right? Making it a, a truth. And and you know to kind of go back to to milestone and, and why we're getting more into maturation techniques you know it's, it's not that we weren't concerned with those early on in fact i think this is a great continuation of our philosophies because you you don't see age statements on our labels right mm -hmm. it's always been maturity over age it's ready when it's ready mm -hmm. um it keeps it keeps the blending table wide open for so many delicious barrels to come into play, uh, which is great, which, you know, I, I think as soon as you put an age statement on something, you're limiting yourself. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's okay. If people, you know, I, for us, that's just, it's not part of our story. And so when we're saying maturity over age, then milestone dives into, all right, well, what are you doing to mature this spirit? Right. In what ways, what techniques are you using? How, what's your approach here? Um, if it isn't just about a number on the bottle, what are you actually doing? And so that's where this release comes into play. And yeah, that, that verum factum idea of the maker's knowledge, right. Is, mm -hmm. well, I, I, I make it. So I, in my own way, proving it to myself that it is real. Right. Yeah. It, it, it definitely comes across, you know, and, and, you know, I, I read the phrase and I'm like, you know, it, it's, it's a phrase, the verum factum and the, the translation of it is going to be somewhat nuanced by whoever reads it but you know it, to me it yeah. reads you know the only thing that i can know is true is that which i create because i created it right i know that it is true but if it's something somebody else created i don't know if it's true or not if they if they stole it if they did whatever but the things i'm making i know are true and and so there's this there's this you know you're effectively putting on display like we made this period this is our truth period right and 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 yes doesn't have to be qualified much farther than that. We, we think this is good. We think that you should enjoy this. Um, there's a lot of, you know, effort and intentionality that goes into these things. Um, it, the, and it's, it's a big enough release. There's even like a, you know, there's, there's like a, a piece of paper on the inside of it and there's a QR code and you can be a part of this uh, milestone society. Um, those things are not easy to do like <laughs> kind of putting all of this together, you know, absolutely having just a bottle is far easier to ship than having a bottle in a box and a note card and a you know website that's going to accept these things. Um, it, as you develop out these ideas, do you ever think like, man, this is, th we have gone too far or is it like, nah, this is exactly what we should be doing. <laughs> oh, of course. But you know, those aren't my departments, right? <laughs> I don't, I don't work in marketing and branding and, um, I don't, mm. I don't submit labels and, uh, I'm not that I'm insensitive to those people. Um, right. 
But, uh, no, I mean, it, it is. It's a heavy lift. It absolutely is. And this one was all hands on deck for sure. No doubt about it. Um, but, you know, this was, we were discussing this for a couple of years before we ever started putting something together. So everybody knew what they were getting into. And, you know, we, we all agreed that this, this was worth it, you know, and this is, um, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, you know, something that we can leave to the world of whiskey that, um, yeah, makes a difference and that people really appreciate. So, no, I mean, I, I think even if you talk about craft spirits in general, you know, um, the people you meet doing this, um, are passionate about it. You have to be, you, you, you can't be part of this world and not be passionate about it. Um, because it wouldn't make any sense to you. And, and it, it would, you'd, you'd have to be out of your mind. Right. Um, this, this is something that we have to do. Right. And to, right. to meet all these other people that are there because they have to do this, uh, is, is, is really cool. It's a really inspiring thing. And so, so yeah, I mean, there are times where these heavy lifts can, can get a little, uh, Rating, I think here and mm -hmm. there, but um, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's just it's worth it. Um, you know, it's like uh, those those bitter roots bear sweet fruit or whatever, as mm -hmm. they say. Um, yeah, it's so, uh, yeah. it's definitely a water the bamboo moment, right? Because you, you got to water <laughs> bamboo for years yeah. before it ever grows up, and then it Absolutely. becomes a thing, and um, that's how long ideation often takes. Um, and, and, and if I go, you know, kind of turning to the, to the commerce side of this a little bit, if I go to your online shop right now, I see that there's a single barrel for sale on your online shop from 2019. Right. Um, and you said you guys have been around for 20 years, but is this a regular occurrence that you guys have these olders or is this just like, oh, we found this in a warehouse somewhere we should sell this now? It's the latter. Yeah. We're not that organized. Um, <laughs> It's something that I think, all right, look, so, you know, this all kind of started with the club, you know, which was first, you know, we have our own club that the brand runs that really just started as, oh, hey, Miles has this barrel of whiskey that's ready. It's one barrel. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll sell it through the tasting room and see how it goes. And that developed into, okay, actually, there's a pretty big interest for this. So um, we developed a club, which, yeah, for the first couple of years was just here in Oregon only, but there seemed to be an outside demand for it. It's now national. We've got something like 4,000 members at this point. And um, now I'm struggling to, you know, get enough volume for a release. Uh, right. Opposed to who wants this. And so, but what we've found though over the years is, um, yeah, there's, there's for one reason or another, some's either, it's either we have some held back or um, a, a shipment is mistakenly returned or mm -hmm. something happens. And yeah, we've kind of, started building up a bit of this library of, of past releases and single barrels, um, which is, which is a really fun thing that, yeah, I think now we just make them available occasionally when we come across something. Um, the club also has gotten to a point where um, it's, it's big enough that we will, what we call open library. And there are some past releases there because, you know, that's the thing with the club. These are, these are a one time only thing, right? That's, that's the allure. Right. That's why people yeah. join. And this is this is it. This is where you're going to see it. Um, and so. So, yeah, no, that's just uh, that's just us kind of occasionally coming across something and saying like, oh, yeah. Let's see if uh, see if we can put it out there as, as a card holding member of of the club. Um, uh, we appreciate it on the eastern half of the United States because, you know, when you do, and this is this is the case, you know, with distilleries in in Kentucky as well, where they have stuff that they'll stick out on their shelves because, you know, exactly what you're talking about. It's a one off run. It was a test lot. It was whatever. Yeah. Um, being able to walk in and pick it up is nice, but when we're looking for something that's not bourbon, you know, we've got to find a way to get this and having this ability to join a club and, uh, have access to it. I've, you know, I've had access to the, to the sourdough release, to a grand Cru grand Cru Sauternes finish, a couple oh, yeah. other single barrels. Um, and then, you know, you always end up picking up the other things, the, the, the Pinot Noir finishes and the stout cask finishes and all of these things. And, uh, you know, I'm always, interested in you know you've had stout and pinot and rum and chardonnay and cognac and um the t word that i'm never going to be able to pronounce um cider uh, all of these <laughs> things how do you identify a thing that you want to finish in like a, a new finish yeah yeah well i mentioned before we're, we're always kind of we're following a vision right and that is um 
uh, it can de develop in a couple ways. One of the ways is just relationship based, mm -hmm. right? Like um, both both the Pinot and the Stout Cask releases, you know, part of our core lineup. Those those came out of uh, relationships, right? So myself, our founder Christian, Andrew, our director of production, a lot of my brewers or distillers were brewers, right? We come from the world of, of brewing and, and, and brewing really inspires a lot of how we make Westward and our, our flavors that we developed. But, um, you know, to that end, it was a brewery I used to work for here in Portland, was looking for a barrel to age. They do this Belgian chocolate imperial stout every holiday season. It's a phenomenal beer. And um, they said, hey, you know, we're actually, we're thinking about aging some in a barrel. So I, I sent them over a whiskey barrel and thought, Man, you know, I bet the the kind of chocolatey, roasty, nutty notes you get in Westwood would be a great flavor match with that. So asked mm -hmm. for it back when they were done. And, uh, you know, we tried and of course, yeah, it turned out wonderfully. And so Stout Cask was born and, you know, we're in the Willamette Valley here. And so just about an hour south of us, we have this amazing wine region where Pinot Noir is the premier varietal, right, that they're known for. And so, um, yeah, you know, a winery that I'm a member of their wine club and um, I thought, you know, well, I love their wine and, and I, I know how they're making it. And I, I, I see potential here. So yeah, maybe I'll, I'll grab a cask, you know, I'll grab one of their used French oak casks and see what happens. So that's, that's one of the ways things can develop. Um, the other is I, I think just flavor driven, you know, I, for better or for worse, I think our marketing team would say for the worst, but I'm, I'm not going to chase trends. You know, I, you've never seen mm -hmm. a, a sherry released from Westward yet. And I mean, sherry single malt, that's, you know, ubiquitous. And I'm not yeah. doing it. I'm not refusing to do it because I'm being, you know, stubborn about it or anything. I just haven't found the, up until recently, I haven't found the right cast and the right kind of flavor match with the right kind of producer. You know, we're not just going to, I'm not just going to buy a bunch of Oloroso butts um, from a broker just because we should do a shared single malt right it's it's got to kind of align with our vision um so yeah maybe i am stubborn actually but um <laughs> now now that i say that out loud but it's um it's really just about flavor if, if it's mm -hmm. going to develop that way um i've, I've got to at least know where the casks are coming from which is hard when you go through brokers there's a lot of non-disclosure agreements they sign which i completely mm -hmm. understand um, it's, it can be dubious in some instances, but yeah, it's, it's just thinking about the flavors that that producer is creating, you know, even that Sauternes cask, I was able to actually get in touch with that winemaker. Um, I'd had their Sauternes before and, you know, it's, it's a late harvest, basically dessert wine, right? And Westward's mm -hmm. certainly sweet side. And so, you know, you have to be careful with that. You're going to put a sweet whiskey in a sweeter wine cask. Like how sweet can you make it before it's just this sort of cloying cotton candy mess, right? Uh, <laughs> but so then it's, you know, knowing their techniques and, and how they make their wine and actually tasting the wine, the product that was in it, that's a big, big part of it, absolutely. And so, I mean, everything when you do it the first time is a bit of a calculated risk, right? I mean, we've been at it long enough. We have our, our empirical knowledge, but um, also, right, we're doing science and in science, failure mm -hmm. is constant, you know? So yes. that's just how it goes. But. <laughs> It's, it's very true. And it, it sounds like you're stubborn, but not for the sake of counterculture, but for the sake of artistry, like until I find the right yeah. ingredient, I don't want to go that direction. Um, you know, at, as you start these test runs on these new things, like how long do you let something run before you either decide to commercialize or you give up on it? Uh, or do you ever give yeah. up on it? Or do you just like, let it keep going and do you see what happens? All of the above. Yeah. Look, I mean, it's, it's all situational, right? But you know, that's the thing. Westward's a, a, a pretty robust spirit. You know, we're running through pot stills that have very, very short toppers with a quick run through the, the line arm, which is angled down towards the condenser. We're talking about a pretty heavy, robust spirit here. And so it, it stands up to other elements pretty well. Um, you know, a typical single malt finishes time. You know, you're looking at three to four months, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Westward's generally at least eight months. Um, that's for most things across the board. Um, there are a few things I've pulled sooner than that. Actually, that Sauternes cask was maybe two months, and I kind of expected that. You Just the way that they produce the wine and how they ferment in the cask, um, I knew that we'd get a little bit of that uh, kind of funky, almost sulfitic note taken on. Mm -hmm. And so 
So yeah, I, I mean, when we do something new, if we're if we're filling into a cask we've never done before, or you know, changed up the mash bill a little bit to add some specialty grains, you know, we're um, we're we're constantly monitoring that. Something going into a new finish, we're pulling a sample every two weeks, you know, and we're trying it at our weekly meeting to see how it is. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we've had some stuff that that didn't work out. Um, we've uh, you know, we've got Gariana Oak here in the Northwest, um, we call it Oregon Oak. Um, it's known as Quercus Gariana. It's, um, you know, Northern California through the Oregon coast up into Washington, I think even in up to BC a little bit, but um, it's such a, it's such an assertive wood. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's just chock full of phenolics that just, I mean, a little goes a long way uh, for sure. And it, I, I personally did not like how it, uh, it's aged with Westward. I mean, this is stuff we did years and years ago. Um, that uh, yeah, it's <laughs> it's one that uh, even though I I just I, I don't I don't hate it. It's just it's not Westward. It's it's changed it so much. And um, mm -hmm. you know, I I'd say at this point I could use it as a little bit of a spice in a blend, but um, I'm I'm just not interested in it. And that's okay, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm not so desperate to to use it um, as to try to force force a way to to put it out there. It's just I don't think it's for us. And uh, so actually now it just sits in neutral French oak vat and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll see. So is there, is there a, um, a wood or a barrel of some type that you haven't gotten an opportunity to use yet that you're like, you're like I, I want Westward to go into that. Yes. Yeah. Black sea oak. Yeah. It's um, black sea oak coming out. You know, the, a lot of the, the wine being made, around that Russian region is is really terrific and that that black sea oat has has such a distinct kind of unique note to it very curious but um and I I was getting a couple I was getting a little headway with a few uh cooperages you know making wine barrels um this was a few years ago but um mm -hmm. ever ever since you know the Russia Ukraine conflict they it's an absolute no go. Like there's no, mm -hmm. nothing's happening. So I'm kind of scouring, looking for used black sea oak barrels for now. But you know, it's it's just something I'm curious about. I don't, I don't feel that I need to have them. But I'd, I'd love to to do some fills on that. Yeah, and um, yeah, actually, just recently, finally was able to put be put in contact directly with um, a Hungarian winemaker making Tokai. Right, that. Um, okay that sweet cave aged wine. And, um, we actually just filled some of those up very recently. So that was one I got to cross off my list. I think that's going to be another one of those, you know, sweet, but not too sweet given its complexity and funk with Westward. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, and, and then maybe the, the last question around finishing, is there, is there a wine from, um, your region that you haven't done yet or that you have done, but you haven't released because it's just not there yet? Yeah, yeah. So obviously Pinot is is the big one here, and then Chardonnay as well. You know, that's what we've kind of got very similar growing conditions in some ways to to Burgundy, France, and that's why a lot of winemakers go and study there, and that's why you see Chardonnay and Pinot Noir coming out of here a lot. Um, there's some great Tempranillo that's being grown on the eastern slopes of the Cascades. We've done Tempranillo casts. Um, the one I I haven't yet. I mean, I've even uh, managed to find some Muscat, some Oregon Muscat casts, which were fun. Um, that was pretty cool. One that I've done that we have not released yet, though, um, there's a winemaker here, Remy Wines. Uh, she's got a super small winery, but she does, uh, she does Italian style, like big Italian inspired red wines. And, um, yeah, we just, uh, I was down there years ago, um, picking up some Pinot casks with the truck as we do. And, um, she mentioned that she was emptying some other casks, which which I always love, right? When we're down there, just like, hey, would you guys maybe want some Syrah casks or some sparkling rosé casks? Like, yeah, of course we mm -hmm. would. Um, I love your wine, and I know it's going to be great. And so, um, and so, yeah, Remy had just emptied a couple um, casks of Dolcetto, which is a a, a big <laughs> a big red wine, um, and. Uh, I said, yeah, absolutely. We'll take them. It was two casts, you know, French oak uh, that she'd, uh, I think, done two or three fills in, vintage fills with Dolcetto. 
And um, I decided, I was like, this one's so kooky, let's just put new make in them. And so we put Westward new make into these used Dolcetto French oak casks. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, just about six years ago. And so these are the only two casts in this warehouse of you know over 6,000 barrels where we've got primary maturation in a used French oak barrel that had held wine. And mm -hmm. uh, I've been tasting it lately and it's outstanding. It's super fun. It's it it's not anything fun. that I think people would expect of Westward. So I'm not sure uh -huh. what we're going to do with it, but it's, it's delicious. <laughs> there, there's some marketer somewhere uh, that's like, you, you start a second line for all these things that uh, don't necessarily <laughs> yeah. fit the standard brand. You know, we call it Eastward or whatever you want to call it. You, know, <laughs> you give it a different name and, and, and release it out and see what happens. Um, you know, I've got at least a dozen more questions, but I am running out of time. Um, you know, yeah, I, I would be yeah, remiss yeah. if I didn't say, Hey, let's, you know, what, what are the, what are the contact points? Where can I buy Westward? Right. Like what, what do I need to be watching for news and updates? And, um, I'll go ahead and plug again. The, the, the club offering on the website is fantastic. Um, there's some States with some really archaic, uh, shipment laws, including the state of Kentucky, but even we are able to participate in this. So if, if I can, likely you can, and that's, it's a great opportunity to, to pick up some, um, some offerings that you might not see anywhere else besides that particular website, but I'll stop and let yeah. you, you know, kind of do the, do the things. Yeah. Right. I mean, each state right, has its own rules and regulations and distributor relationships and all of that, that fun, fun stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, you can, you know, our, our, website westwardwhiskey.com has got all the info uh we're in i think about 35 states now these days what we've got that's great is on the site there's a finder right so i think you can pop your mm -hmm. zip code in maybe i think it is and uh it'll show you where the the nearest retailer is for mm -hmm. you know that's where you're going to find our core lineup and and maybe potentially a single barrel here or there um you know we're on we're on instagram for for more news westward whiskey also is the handle there but yeah what you can also do on the website is you can check out the club that's your kind of portal to the westward club as well to you know check out past releases join i mean joining is free right you just there's no annual membership fee you, just, you pay for the bottles when we ship them um and we do go through i think it's speakeasy so yeah right they can find a way usually around some some local mm -hmm. local legislation um, <laughs> for the most part. And then, um, yeah, I mean, that's where we're also announcing, you know, we have, we have member, um, events all over the country. I was actually just in Denver last week for ACSA and we had a big, like 70 person member event at the seven grand there in Denver. Uh, it was a ton of fun. We're doing one in, um, I think, uh, Los Angeles, maybe next week. Um, we've, we've done them in DC. So, yeah, I mean, that's 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 pretty much a, the best way to keep up with what we're doing for sure. Um, that's uh, we're all we're always up to something. But yeah, westwardwhiskey.com, Check it out. And like I said, that's where the club is. Also, if you want to see the the fun, kooky things that we're we're popping out to to challenge people's taste buds, you know. Yeah. Um, so like I said, th thanks for your time. You know, that's the one thing that you can never create more of, you know, the time is, 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 um, the most valuable thing you have. And, and I always appreciate when people give me their time. Um, so uh, like I said, I've, I've got a lot more things, but I don't have the time and I don't need to take any more of your time. So, um, always appreciative. Thank you for hopping on and having the conversation. Well, thanks for your time and, you know, thanks for your support as well for, uh, American single mall. I think that's really cool. So. Thanks for tuning in for this episode from the Embellish Pod. If you enjoyed this, please leave me a review on whatever platform that you're consuming this on. Leave a comment if possible. Hit me up on social media on TikTok or Instagram using Embellish Pod and give me a follow so you can keep up with what's going on here. I can be found at www.embellishpod.com with all of my links, accounts, contact details, and more. Thanks for stopping by.